very, very pleased that the evening lecture course series this year uh, is going to be started by Fashid and Alejandro. Uh, and it would be a waste of time for me to introduce them. They're obviously very well known to the school. Uh, the evidence of that is both in the room and the fact that downstairs uh, the video relay room is even more packed like sardines. Um, they're going to speak uh, about the work of the office uh, after Yokohama um, and we'll start directly and at the end uh, they're happy to take some questions. So uh, I'd like to welcome Fashid and Alejandro. Okay, thank you, Mark. Uh, it's uh, also very nice for us to be uh, back at the AA, uh, which is a very dear uh, place uh, for us, where we, we have the feeling we grew up quite a lot. Um, the lecture today is going to be a little bit uh, uh, chaotic, like, uh, like uh, <laughs> life itself. <laughs> and we are going to be uh, swapping all the time. So it's going to be a little bit of a, of a kind of uh, improvisation on a number of projects that we have been involved uh, after Yokohama. Yokohama was uh, uh, for us a very, obviously a very important uh, project that opened many uh, possibilities uh, and, and also now closed, or we feel it closed, uh, uh, a certain phase of uh, the, the, the work of the office. The work uh, that we were <coughs> doing uh, in Yokohama and, and I think also very much here uh, when we were doing uh, Deep Five was particularly interested in, in the possibilities or, or the exploration of, uh, of construction of the internal consistency of the, of the projects or some, some sort of uh, uh, technical uh, uh, exploration that uh, evolves into uh <coughs> potentially uh, innovative uh, architectural uh, solutions and uh, Yokohama was a fantastic opportunity uh, obviously to uh, to do this uh, it was a project that uh, occupied uh, a lot of time and enabled us almost to uh, explore some of the, the things that theoretically we, we had been uh, doing here uh, at, at the AA with, with our group uh, and uh, uh, after Yokohama, um, we have been, uh, we have had the, the luxury of, of uh, being involved in, in many other uh, projects. And what we are going to try to do today is to explain uh, what has happened to us after after completing this project and, and what is happening in the office in this new uh, situation. Uh, what has happened is that. Obviously, the, the, the luxury of time that we had in Yokohama, uh, we don't have any more. Uh, we are uh, involved uh, with, uh, the, 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 let's say, the power of the external forces that are uh, operating on the projects is much uh, more intense than it was when we were uh, here. And uh, most uh, notably, uh, we think uh, these, these forces have uh, pushed us, has uh, forced us to revise some of the precepts uh, upon which we had constructed the early part of, uh, of the work in the, in the office uh, and perhaps accept that uh, when you are in practice you need to uh, be able to, to communicate, you need to, to be able to engage with uh, forces that are external to that internal consistency of the of the project that had uh, driven uh, those early uh, years <coughs> and we are now actually very excited about uh, maybe uh, going back to to metaphors or analogs or things that uh, probably when we were uh, lecturing here uh, we we would we would uh, reject as, as, uh, as points of departure or history, for example, uh, typologies. Uh, there, there were things that, that in some ways we were trying to move, move away from. 
uh, and in this new situation, we are revisiting them. We are revisiting them as, as raw material that enables us to construct the form. And, and we've, we, we've uh, grown quite interested in, in the fact that by resorting to those, uh, to those uh, technologies, to those devices, uh, you, don't, uh, you don't diminish the, the value of the, of the, of the uh, project. Uh, on the contrary, you expand it in, in many other directions. And probably uh, the, the art that we are learning now is the art of uh, constructing this internal consistency out of these more sometimes, uh, sometimes uh, uh, almost, na I wouldn't say naive, but the, the immediate uh, um, way of communicating the, the projects to, to, to a, a wider um, a sector of the, of the public. All the, all the, the projects that we are going to show are commissions, are, are real uh, projects, except the, the first one, which is uh, I mean, in some ways it was uh, uh, an inv a kind of invited uh, competition, but uh, it's a project that I, I think is particularly in in interesting in terms of uh, framing this debate between the way the project is constructed from itself, between uh, the way the, 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 the project develops a certain internal uh, consistency and the way the project is communicated, the, the way the project is broadcast. <laughs> Uh, the World Trade Center uh, involvement happened in, in two phases. <coughs> uh, the first phase was an invitation by Max Protech to do a sketch on how the, the project could become. Uh, the second uh, uh, opportunity regarding this project was uh, the fact that we were selected uh, as part of the United Architects team uh, to do the, the shortlist. Um, and uh, what is interesting is uh, that the, in that first uh, uh, approach, we were strongly trying to react to those external constraints and, on the, uh, and, and uh, trying to avoid to relate to the problems of signification, of representation that obviously were in a way overloading the, uh, the project. <coughs> and uh, when we had to operate as part of uh, one of the six teams, we had to suddenly change entirely the, the strategy. Uh, and yet, we think that there are many things that uh, remain consistent between both of them. And that kind of consistency is the consistency that we are trying to explore uh, now. Uh, we were actually in New York when, when the attack uh, happened, and uh, uh, we witnessed the, the whole mm, mess and the whole uh, pressure that, uh, that was generated in, in, in the city around the, the project and in a way the, the, the first approach uh, to, to do this, this uh, uh, exercise uh, was to try to avoid to engage into these things. So we simply took the project and said who cares about what happened here, this is, and, and this was actually the first sentence in our statement, the sentence that was later on uh, censored by the publication by Max Protech uh, Gallery, because obviously it was uh, politically incorrect to say that we didn't want to, to re remember anything. Uh, uh, on the contrary, we, we uh, move into the, uh, the, the possibility of simply building the, the tallest building in the world again in Manhattan. Uh, and uh, by doing so, uh, do a research on uh, uh, high-rise building typologies. So first thing we did was to analyze, in a way we, we moved out of the, the, the world, the, the external world, and we, we went deep into the discipline of architecture, uh, uh, and very specifically in the typology of high-rise structures. We look at these uh, diagrams, we notice that as buildings grow taller, they develop in the plan uh, areas of, uh, of uh, condens concentration of, of mass in order to resist the lateral uh, stresses until they reach, uh, and, and basically the mass of the building moves to the periphery in order to gain, uh, to maximize the inertia of the, of the uh, horizontal section of the, of the building until it reaches uh, the, the limit of slenderness. So the question was how can we make 
the next generation of uh, tall buildings that can grow even taller. And we studied uh, some of the, of the pre-existing uh, typologies. We, we, as you can imagine, we were very clearly going back to the history of architecture in this, uh, in this exercise. Uh, and uh, we looked at uh, the, the tallest uh, buildings. We, we uh, saw uh, the original one with the, the, the peripheral, uh, the, the structure concentrated in the, in the facade, the Sears Tower with uh, not a very different uh, typology, but a typology that has been uh, proliferated in, into a number of towers. Uh, and, and uh, that has become maybe in some areas too deep. Uh, the Kuala Lumpur towers uh, already addressing the, the problem of the depth of the, of the plan of the offices when you want to grow uh, taller and splitting the mass into two. So we, we thought, uh, thinking in these uh, typologies, that maybe the way to grow taller uh, without having the problems of the Sears Towers or, or even the, the original World Trade Center that took, I think, 20 years to be fully leased, uh, was to split the, the building into a number of towers that were uh, buttressing each other and, uh, and by doing uh, uh, so, uh, uh, maintaining the slenderness of the, of the towers. Uh, uh, so uh, the, the diagram, in a way, that we proposed was, uh, was a diagram made out of a number of towers that were touching each other uh, every uh, 30 floors to limit the buckling uh, span of the of the towers to a more or less <coughs> conventional structure, and what was also interesting about this project is is that the the the, the way this took shape was by saying we are going to go uh, uh, up to 110 meters high to become the tallest uh, building in the in the world, uh, and we are gonna ho we are gonna use the same amount of matter that uh, existed in the original. Uh, twin towers, which is 8.8 uh, 8 .8 million square feet of, uh, of construction. So we divided that amount of construction into uh, the number of floors that we wanted to have to reach that, uh, that level, and then we divided that number also into the average lease uh, in Manhattan, which was at the time uh, 1,300 uh, square meters uh, uh, footprint. And that ba basically gave us the number of towers, the number of towers uh, that uh, had to compose the, the scheme. So you see basically how it was working. The towers were leaning into each other, and uh, that was uh, uh, making structural re redundancy, but was also creating redundancy uh, in, the, in the vertical circulation uh, systems, uh, because basically by uh, introducing these uh, points of contact, we uh, produced a series of uh, lobbies that were uh, distributed through the building and, and would enable to share uh, egress and access uh, systems to the different uh, towers. <coughs> uh, that same structure was applied also to the, to the facade of each one of the, of the towers uh, that was basically isomorphic from the overall uh, uh, scheme. These are some images of how it will look like. And then we had to move into the, the, the real competition and into the real, so we, we had generated this scheme simply out of looking at structural typologies of uh, high rises. Now we had to kind of uh, uh, do something that would be uh, able to interact with the public opinion that was, uh, was uh, um, <coughs> basically asking for, for that kind of representative uh, monument. Uh, and we started to uh, think about uh, th things like that. No? Uh, also uh, things like the, the, the motto that uh, the Americans uh, chose uh, to, to drive the, the whole campaign of the rebuilding was united with, uh, with uh, We Stand, which was not very dissimilar to the way the scheme had turn, turned out. The towers were standing up tall because they were leaning onto each other. Uh, and that, we thought, was maybe an image that could be able to, to deal with the monumental uh, uh, question that was now put onto the, 
onto the project. This was the, the project that we did with, uh, with uh, Ben van Berkel and, and uh, Greg Lean and Kevin Cannon and Jesse Reiser, who were our partners in this endeavor. <coughs> there were some other things that we started adding to the, 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 the project, the idea that in the traditional uh, uh, European uh, skyline, uh, the mass of the buildings are homogeneous and then there are the monuments. In the American uh, traditional city there are uh, basically towers that act almost as individual uh, uh, agents uh, and uh, we were proposing maybe this idea of towers that touch each other as uh, perhaps the next uh, stage of the development of, of, uh, of uh, the American downtown as cities that, uh, as uh, towers that Yes, they have a certain independent uh, drive, but they, have, they belong to a more uh, collective, uh, uh, more common uh, project. So this is uh, the project that came out of that exercise, was a project that uh, had some similarities to the original one, but uh, also was different in many ways, had to deal much more directly with these requirements for uh, representation and monumentality. We had to keep the, the footprints empty. Uh, we, we couldn't uh, close, in this case, the, the circle. And in the other case, we had to deal with, uh, with the underground uh, system that uh, uh, happens under the, the towers and is actually quite uh, complex. Uh, there are all kinds of transportation systems uh, underneath that, in a way, force the location of the, of the footprints. Uh, and uh, but basically, and, and then how this uh, object fits within the grid of the of the lower uh, Manhattan was uh, determinant of of the final form of this uh, project. Uh, these are some of the images of how the towers will uh, relate to the local uh, urban landscape. This is going slow. It's taking a long time to move. Okay. A uh, very different one that Farshid is going to explain. <laughs> so um, I guess well, Alejandro has, has uh, already mentioned that um, uh, the, the projects that we are showing tonight are uh, to convey that uh, when you are in practice, uh, you have extra material, if you like, to, to play with. And um, I think it's important maybe to add that this doesn't mean that you're no longer interested in consistency in the work uh, and internal consistency. For example, it was not so long ago that we uh, exhibited at the ICA, uh, brought out our book of uh, phylogenesis and uh, showed uh, quite a kind of uh, precise and systematic way of relating the projects. Uh, so there are, one can set up uh, as a kind of internal research to the, to the practice shorter or longer term uh, experiments on, on a particular theme that, ha that are uh, primarily, if you like, uh, you could say personal or architectural. Uh, and and in, in, in that case, we were talking about uh, a kind of obsession or a research on surfaces. Uh, but finally, what we were trying to communicate was that the projects were also different. And uh, what we are trying to communicate uh, uh, here tonight are uh, that the differences are primarily those that come from the outside and that we are very interested in them. We are interested in experimenting, exploiting with them, uh, exploiting these extra material that comes to you only when you're in practice. Um, so for example, this is uh, a uh, police uh, headquarters, a police station that we had to realize in the city of Villajoyosa in Spain, the site being uh, uh, right here, yeah. it's here. Sorry, mm -hmm. and um, it the the um, and you know not not a particularly um, inspiring, if you like, site in 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 its immediate uh, kind of way, surrounded by these uh, not so uh, successful 60s building. It's this uh, triangular site here, and the brief in itself uh, it sounds more glamorous uh, to say that it's a it's a police headquarters, but actually it was an office building. Um, and now office buildings come, uh, you know, tight in the requirements of uh, basically there is a manual 
of what depth you need to, to uh, provide and how much light you need and what is the spacing behind the depth. Um, and therefore, as, as, as someone who is uh, committed to experiments, you try to see, well, what are the extra material that you can bring in to the exercise uh, in order to make it problematic for yourself, in order to uh, force yourself uh, to, uh, to experiment. So in this case, we look at um, uh, the immediate, but also the distant context. We uh, look at uh, the footprint uh, of, of, the, of the building and how it relates to uh, its triangular form. We start offsetting by the regulations uh, that are given to you of how far you need to be away from the road. We start uh, arriving to a kind of pentagonal shape and immediately uh, start realizing that this could resonate with the Pentagon. And the fact that, uh, for example, a Pentagon and a police station could be uh, a kind of experiment. Um, or, for example, that if you have this uh, Pentagon and you uh, obviously have a very deep building and yet it needs to be an office building, uh, the way to introduce light into the building through the roof could again be another uh, way to produce a different kind of office building to what one would otherwise do if you were start, if to start analyzing uh, the requirements of an office building that gives you normally a kind of uh, a slab or a bank. Um, uh, and this starts really uh, arranging, if you like, the program. There are a series of different uh, office uh, requirements between you know, the police and there are some areas that are dedicated to, to the citizens and it provides a, non, a certain number of ent entrances that is perhaps not uh, so interesting to discuss here and a, a kind of courtyard in the middle that uh, is necessary to, to kind of light the kind of the deepest area of the plan. Um, now, we again start uh, as a way of, if you like, making, uh, because you need to kind of run, to keep running the experiment until you, you think that you've produced uh, a kind of consistent uh, organization, something that is interesting, that is, that is uh, interesting as a, as a form, if you like, that it relates to its uh, context in an interesting way, and it produces a, a kind of interesting uh, office organization. So we keep looking, and uh, for example, another element we, we brought to the, to the kind of project was to think that uh, the landscape that is surrounding uh, the city is um, actually uh, filled with a number of uh, agricultural sheds that are very beautiful. And we uh, start playing with the section of this basic uh, shed-like uh, structure and simply applying it to an irregular pentagon produces these irregularities in this section. So uh, that is uh, again, another kind of resonance that we introduce into, into uh, the building with its external context. Uh, and we arrive to this uh, broken rock form that, again, we realize that there is another moment where we can tap into uh, this uh, external uh, space of the project, which is the mountains that surround. Uh, maybe we had a picture earlier. Uh, here, the, the mountains and the rocks, this is the kind of the distant landscape that is much more special finally than, than the immediate context and that this, uh, as a result of bringing together these number of uh, influences and, and, uh, and uh, decisions, we arrive to this broken uh, rock-like um, mass uh, that is, is actually quite, uh, quite interesting and it blends very well uh, with its, uh, with its uh, context. We then have to, uh, this is obviously a very internal project because the police, it's a private building, they don't really want to be looked into. And uh, therefore, uh, we needed to look at a way of producing small openings uh, to bring lighting and to give some visual communication for the police to the outside. And so we start playing with a kind of bullet hole pattern. Again, being pl <laughs> uh, playful with the idea that it is a police station and there are some cells in the basement, etc. And um, so this produces uh, this, uh, this uh, pattern of holes <coughs> on the facade. Uh, we uh, then obviously have to uh, decide what do we build this form in. And we were very interested in, um, given the fact that the, this, uh, the client was very interested in being almost uh, discreet, uh, secretive, 
to try it as an experiment to camouflage the building with its context as much as possible, blend it uh, uh, as a color with its context, and we, we kind of did a test of uh, mixing uh, concrete with uh, crushed uh, stones, uh, local stones, to, to mimic the color of the earth, and that's basically what, uh, what, the, what the building gets uh, built in. Um, and, and in fact, uh, you know, the first time that, that uh, I went myself to, myself to the site, uh, at, at the moment you could also almost miss the building because it, it is uh, quite, uh, quite absent as, because of the, the color uh, issue. Uh, so all, all these uh, start um, crystallizing or consolidating a very particular character characteristic for this building that is not like you would do for any other building. And this is what we are trying to communicate, that, that uh, we are now no longer interested in uh, just repeating Yokohama because it was a successful exercise. Um, and uh, in fact, Yokohama was, uh, at that time, uh, one that we believed was exclusive to the problem and exclusive uh, as an experiment. But of course, then you, it becomes a successful project and people expect you to keep on repeating that. Uh, but in fact, if we are to be consistent, we have to be committed to experiment rather than committed to repeat uh, Yokohama. So uh, this is uh, a, a not a case, let's say, of us trying to do that. And these are some of the interiors. Uh, and I'll pass you to Alejandro now. I think we are going to have to go faster. Uh, the next project is a project that we are uh, doing now in, in Barcelona, <coughs> in this uh, location. Uh, uh, here is a, is a project that we started together with Arata Isosaki for a complex office complex, uh, 70,000 square meters of uh, offices in this site in the fringe of the city, between the city and the airport, uh, in a former industrial area that is now being uh, dramatically redeveloped. This is the site, uh, an old factory that will be demolished. Uh, and the, the, the way we started the, the project was with this idea that we had to produce the, the model for the fabric of the future city in this location, uh, the system in a way, to grow not only this site, but use this site almost as a prototype for growing a fabric in, in that location. This location is, uh, as I mentioned, on the fringe of the city. Uh, that makes it very uncertain in terms of uh, what kind of offices uh, are going to be required because there is not a clear clientele. Uh, and this uh, uh, led us into the, the idea that perhaps uh, what we could do uh, was to generate the fabric out of uh, the, the possibility of being able to host many different typologies of uh, offices because we didn't know whether the future uh, occupants were going to uh, use uh, deep plants or thin plants or what. So we did a test of a system uh, of a grid that would enable us to almost uh, allocate everything from uh, deeper offices to parkings to smaller cell offices uh, to hotels. There are some uh, hotel uh, facilities in the, in the uh, plan <coughs> and we propose as the master plan that then we are developing in individual building buildings, uh, each one of the architects involved in the, in the project, uh, this uh, system of what we call virtual volumes, which are cubes uh, approximately 45 meters high by 50 meters by 50 meters, uh, where uh, that are uh, placed on the site in this uh, fashion in which uh, each they can be developed as independent uh, faces, but they have always one point of contact, so that potentially you could develop everything as a single 70,000 square meter uh, continuous office building, or you could uh, split, you could occupy this virtual volume in a way that keeps a distance uh, with the neighboring ones. And this virtual volume possibility also of uh, produce a wide variety of, uh, of uh, plants, sometimes deeper, sometimes uh, larger, sometimes uh, smaller. Uh, 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 this is basically uh, how the master plan is uh, uh, constructed, almost uh, as if it was a kind of Tetris game in which as, as investment is deployed onto the site, the, 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 the master plan is able to reorganize itself to absorb and incorporate this, this contingency of, of, the, of the process 
not as a, as, a, as a resistance to the master plan, but on the contrary, as a, as a driver, as a force of diversification of the, of the master plan. Uh, so uh, uh, the other, the other uh, thing that is important in this project is uh, the idea of revising uh, the, the, the concept of a lobby, of entrance uh, lobby, that is a uh, kind of usually climatized uh, space, uh, but this, in this case in a Mediterranean climate. So what we try to do is to make this campus of interlaced uh, gardens that are uh, somehow covered or enclosed by uh, the different buildings. Uh, we set as uh, master planners the maximum footprint that these buildings can touch the, the ground so that basically we ensure a certain amount of public space to be left uh, empty and also the possibility of always being able to connect through all these uh, different uh, gardens and as we uh, grow up in section, there are uh, an infinite number of uh, possibilities uh, of more independent or more connected uh, s uh, blocks. This, this is one possible scenario. That there are an infinite number of uh, scenarios in the project. And also, as the project uh, uh, grows, there are also uh, uh, gardens uh, on the terraces above. You can see uh, how the gardens how the buildings are, uh, can also be diversified by the, <coughs> by the color, by the texture uh, they have to maybe represent the, the identity of the future uh, occupants uh, of, the, of the master plan. Uh, and uh, the buildings are also uh, covering, uh, acting almost as, as, uh, as oversized uh, canopies over the the public uh, space. This is uh, the first phase that we are building is uh, due to start construction uh, imminently uh, and is basically uh, a building with these 15 meter cantilevers on the, on the sides that are basically uh, uh, hovering over the, the public space. Uh, it has two uh, typologies of plan in the same volume. Uh, one that is a more conventional uh, deep uh, plan uh, office building. And the other one is the upper floors, which are the ones that make the cantilever over the public space that then become very deep and, and, and produce a, a kind of courtyard uh, at, the, at the roof of the, of the building. So it's a, a, a very different type of space to the one, the, 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 sp the one below is basically occupying that space and those areas are cantilevered over the public space to produce that kind of monumental entrance and, and, and canopy over the public space. So next is uh, a park that we, in Barcelona, that we completed last summer for the Forum <coughs> 2004 that was a, a kind of initiative of uh, the city of Barcelona to develop a part of the waterfront that ends uh, uh, with the, di the diagonal at one end of the diagonal, and uh, that used to be uh, a kind of industrial area of the city. Now, um, uh, maybe the competition drawings are not so. Uh, the, 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 there were a kind of number of, um, uh, let's say, uh, material that were obviously uh, internal uh, to to the to the kind of brief uh, one that uh, we had to provide with a series of outdoor auditoriums. This was a park that had to be a kind of hard landscape park. It was an active park. It was not a contemplative park. Uh, secondly, that there was a difference uh, in, in level between where the, the, the kind of the, the platform that joined to the diagonal, um, uh, the, the level of that, and then the, the level of the sea, there was an 11 meter drop. We had to bridge that. This was also another uh, let's say function we had to, to incorporate. Uh, also, uh, the <coughs> sea breezes uh, that um, were uh, facing uh, this park uh, are highly contaminated, and uh, we were asked to provide uh, as much greenery as possible. Uh, and this was also a challenge, a kind of function that we had to uh, to organize uh, the kind of uh, the greenery or the plantation. Um, we, uh, 
obviously these were the the the, the kind of um, the, the given, but uh, it was actually uh, land that we had to uh, reclaim, um, and uh, therefore uh, the question was in what form, uh, what form will it take, uh, and we were very interested in finding uh, a, a kind of uh, intersection across these uh, functions that uh, would uh, perhaps find an analog outside of the basic functions. For example, an analog uh, that we uh, eventually, these were competition drawings, uh, that we picked up was the dunes. Uh, dunes as, as uh, a dunar uh, landscape, as uh, a kind of um, formal uh, type that can give you um, areas that are, uh, if you like, uh, auditorium-like. Uh, they have sloped areas, they have flat areas, they have protected faces and unprotected faces, depending on how you orientate uh, these kind of junior uh, organization. And that's really the experiment that, uh, that drives the project. We start looking at uh, the different uh, auditorium um, uh, kind of constraints uh, or regulations, uh, uh, vision issues, uh, the geometries that you have to work with, uh, and uh, end up with uh, this geometry that uh, organizes a series of auditoriums of uh, different sizes, uh, a large auditorium, if I can get my, uh, a large auditorium here, a smaller one here, and uh, basically these become these uh, dunes, these uh, angular parts of, uh, of the ground that we, we pour here with uh, flat areas that are uh, the areas where, where the kind of uh, the rock concerts, the, the functions of the auditoriums will mainly, mainly happen. We go on to consider construction as a material, uh, knowing that it has to be hard landscaping. We also know that it will obviously have to have a kind of um, a construction uh, unit or a kind of aggregate that builds this hard uh, landscape. We start uh, uh, again um, looking outside of the project, uh, knowing that we are in Barcelona, knowing that we are in Catalonia. Uh, we were very interested in uh, the kind of history uh, or the culture of tiling that uh, was uh, explored with Dujol and Gaudi. And we saw that this was a, a great uh, way to contextualize uh, the project, uh, to relate to that uh, history, and uh, yet to do it differently as this was going to be at a territorial scale, at a scale very different to those uh, previous experiments. So we study different tiling configurations and uh, end up with this moon-shaped tile that when it gets arrayed uh, around different curves, it produces this uh, conveyor belt uh, uh, interlocking uh, system that um, proves to be extremely adequate because it can constantly bifurcate and uh, adapt uh, or if you like, generate this uh, differentiated topography uh, without ever having to be cut. Uh, the tiles had to take a uh, car load uh, in many of the different areas and therefore they were very deep. Uh, the, the, the question of uh, cutting them on site was uh, not uh, uh, really something to consider. So uh, this, uh, as you see, the, the tile uh, fills certain edges and uh, just remains um, unfinished in the other ones and gets filled uh, with, uh, with grass or concrete in certain areas. Um, and these are the, the different kind of uh, uh, ways that it, uh, it, uh, it branches. Um, greenery, uh, again, as a kind of default option, we start covering all the dunes uh, and then start taking out all those faces that are facing uh, the sea breezes, for example, this one, uh, because uh, obviously uh, they would not survive and all the faces that are uh, away from the sea breezes um, keep uh, their greenery and produce um, out of uh, negotiating with this uh, constraint of the direction of the sea breezes against the dunes, uh, you produce, uh, you get this differentiated settlement of greenery on the park. Um, these are some views of uh, the park still on the construction. We, uh, we actually don't have them uh, completed. Uh, but as you see, they also grow as a retaining system uh, to produce verti a vertical, um, uh, the vertical extensions of, of the ground. And back to Alejandro. No, 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 me me as well? Do, 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 do. Okay. Um, 
<laughs> As you see, it is completely improvised. So this, uh, this was a commission, but, but actually it's, uh, it, it will not uh, go ahead. Uh, we were asked to look at uh, a department store, a uh, selfish department store uh, uh, in Bristol. The, the owners uh, changed, and um, therefore they will not do a store in, uh, in Bristol. Uh, but it is uh, maybe, uh, in any case, uh, relevant to, to this discussion tonight. Uh, this uh, pink area or um, purple area uh, was to be the site of the project. Um, we were told that the, the interior would uh, not uh, be able to communicate with the outside. In other words, it was to be a blank building, uh, completely blank. So here is a situation where as an architect you think, well, then what is the experiment? Uh, because uh, you can't explore transparency, you can't explore any kind of uh, relationship between interior and exterior. Uh, the experiment was really about the skin and, and therefore, uh, perhaps, how does the skin relate to its context? Uh, how does it relate to a kind of constructive system? Uh, and how does it become ornate, really? What happened here, Alejandro? I don't know, there's a mistake in the order. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so I got you. <laughs> that was a kind of. Uh, Can I go and find them? Yes. Can you move forward, maybe? Oh, Is God. there? Huh? Uh, the, the PowerPoint is very heavy, so it, it, is, uh, it has been plain funny. Uh, or what I could do is you start, and I'll pick up on, on what I said when the, when the slides come up. I think it's better. No, no, seriously, it doesn't make sense. Far as I go. Huh? So no, remember no, no. what I told you. No, I, it was just one slide. I didn't come back. It just makes sense to look forever. No, no, I, it, I only showed you one slide, so I'll pick up on it. Don't worry. Okay, this is another one that is uh, now under construction. It's uh, for a, a technology center in uh, Rioja, in, in the place where they make wines in, in Spain. Uh, the site is a fantastic uh, landscape. It's this area uh, uh, in a kind of uh, beautiful uh, river uh, site with this uh, strong topography uh, uh, on, on one edge uh, looking towards the, the river. Uh, which is basically away from where we are now. This is the, the entrance onto the, the site. And <coughs> this is a, a, the, the, the building, uh, despite being in this uh, idyllic uh, site, is a building for uh, a, a kind of university, uh, education, nursery uh, uh, of um, companies that are related to a web uh, relate web services, uh, basically, uh, and uh, basically what we uh, had to do was to locate the the site first in this uh, large uh, site by the by the river. This is the river side, and this is basically the area that is more connected to the city, which is the area where we decide to locate first the plan of the site almost uh, trying to leave as much as possible uh, uh, free uh, landscape and views uh, towards the, the, the riverside and, uh, and a large area for uh, nurseries, uh, f a kind of uh, uh, agricultural nurseries that are also part of the, of the uh, use that the, the government wants to do. Uh, with the, the site, so the, the, the way the building uh, <coughs> uh, will happen uh, tries to take uh, also some ideas out of uh, the, the typical uh, vegetation, the typical uh, um, uh, agricultural uh, specialities of the, of the uh, area of La Rioja, which is basically wine yards, uh, and uh, is organized in a very a straightforward manner as two uh, uh, floors of, uh, of a slab that uh, makes, therefore, the plan very uh, flexible, but that at the same time are covered with uh, a, a mesh of cables where uh, plants, uh, maybe even winders, are going to uh, swallow the, the building and turn it into, into uh, an, an element of, the, of that uh, landscape. <coughs> you see that the building is located uh, uh, next to that uh, sloped uh, landscape, 
it's aligned at its top with the with the top of the uh, uh, the the this is where the city and on this level is where the city ends and the idea is that the building will uh, connect maybe we'll see it better uh, in uh, you, you see here basically where the building connects to the to the city and uh, becomes a kind of octopus that uh, uses this linear structure of classrooms or offices uh, to uh, uh, produce internal gardens that are uh, between the, the sloped walls and the building and uh, also produces this uh, very luxurious condition of uh, a thin building that has one face towards the internal garden, one, one, first towards the, uh, one face to, towards the, the landscape. This is the way that the building is organized. It's, it's a very repetitive system. We try to make the building, even if it is uh, theoretically three separate buildings, we try to make it into a single building that then uh, uses the same structure for, for different functions so that in the future it can grow into uh, uh, different uh, <coughs> configurations. And this is the way also the, the, the building connects to the two edges of the, of the city and um, uh, produces, uh, looking towards these internal uh, courtiers, some ramp system that is uh, almost an extension of the, of the topography of the, of the city uh, as a kind of belvedere uh, of, uh, for, for, the, for the citizens on top of the building that then uh, goes down into this uh, internal uh, courtyard. Here you see the, that uh, section, it's a very simple section, the, the building requires a lot of technical uh, facilities uh, uh, and this is the system of uh, plants, the, the mesh of uh, <coughs> plants that will be growing around the building and answering to different local conditions like uh, views uh, towards different areas, uh, partial uh, cover of this uh, uh, rooftop uh, area, the rooftop uh, Velvedere. <coughs> uh, these are some images of how these cables will be reacting to, to these uh, specificities of the, of the site and, and this kind of landscape that w they will produce as, as almost a building that is covered with, with the greenery, almost a building that becomes a, a wine yard and where you are walking inside of this mesh uh, where plants uh, will uh, grow. I think there is a, an animation of uh, of the project, if this works, because let's not let's not look at the animation. <laughs> it's boring anyway. Okay. Back to, you back to what I was saying. <laughs> yes, so, um, uh, as I as I mentioned earlier, uh, uh, the, the the kind of experiment that we isolated uh, uh, was uh, questioning the skin. Uh, the envelope and really uh, given the fact that it was to be a very large volume um, uh, the main issue was how do you actually um, give a certain intricacy to this uh, envelope this, uh, this building was to be in the city center and obviously if you have of uh, it uh, as a kind of monolithic building with no intricacy it would uh, ab absolutely not um, uh, negotiate with the context in any way. It, it was surrounded by pedestrian streets, uh, etc. Uh, so, really, the 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 the, um, the the research that we started setting up, that as I mentioned, didn't go very far, uh, was uh, uh, what is the kind of um, system that is going to ornate this facade and play with ornamentation, just like in other projects we brought in the metaphor or analogs and, and turn them into, use them as raw material. Here, uh, ornamentation was what we were trying to play with. Um, however, revisiting the chapter on ornamentation and, uh, for example, the very interesting uh, discussions that um, uh, Venturi and Scott Brown brought into, uh, uh, into, into the scene that uh, ornamentation can be used as a way of mediating the building with, uh, with uh, the culture that surrounds it. However, uh, as I said, evolving that and thinking that 
uh, ornament no, need not be uh, a kind of discrete uh, uh, detail that is uh, in contradiction with the constructive system. In fact, it could be one that generates uh, the constru a constructive system. It could be one that produces um, a, a kind of consistent organization, a consistent, in this case, envelope for the building. So we looked at uh, different um, uh, tiling, um, uh, different uh, geometry tiles and uh, different sizes uh, that would uh, produce the constructive units, it's simply plates of different material that would produce this wrap. Uh, they would have uh, a number of uh, uh, variations in, in size and therefore would produce out of the way they would uh, link with each other uh, a certain variation uh, to the envelope that was trying to adjust with the differences of, uh, let's say, the differences in the context. Um, now, you see just from these uh, uh, different images that the different size, literally the different size that you use, produces either a more smooth envelope or a more rocky, if you like, or more crystal-like envelope, and produces a very different kind of interface between the building and its context. Um, these were the different kind of experiments that we had set up. Again, this uh, basic tile applied to different uh, sectional profiles will ob obviously introduce uh, other, uh, other accidents uh, or other uh, differences in the basic um, uh, tiling system. And I mean, there were other experiments of how to deal with the interior, but I think the, the interesting thing for the purpose of our discussion tonight is the fact that what produced uh, here uh, some um, a driver for the project was uh, the issue of the ornament. Uh, these all really relate uh, to that. I don't think we need to get into them. Uh, is this me? Yeah, no, this is me. <laughs> uh, this is a, a, a project that we are uh, now starting. is is a bit of a of a of a joke. Uh, it's also in Barcelona, very close to the park. You see the park. And the, this is the area that was developed uh, as the Barcelona Forum. And the centerpiece of that development is this building that is designed by Herzog and de Meron. It's, a, it's an auditorium of a triangular shape that uh, takes basically uh, the relationship with the diagonal and, and the coastline to produce that uh, triangular shape. And uh, we started this project because a, a developer invited us to a competition that we won uh, to do a, an, an, a housing project in this site, in front of the, of the forum building. This is basically uh, the site, and this is the, the triangle. Uh, the, site is, uh, the site is here, is this uh, barracks, this former <coughs> bus uh, storage for the, from the city. And basically what we did originally a bit of, uh, as, a, as a kind of a joke, was to say, well, if the main building in the area is a triangle, uh, we are going to simply make another triangle. Uh, and and uh, I mean, that, that uh, sounds like a, like a very uh, silly idea, but actually as we, we started uh, playing with it, we realized that it, it made a lot of uh, sense because that triangle Oops, I don't know why this is so sensitive. This uh, triangle is pointed towards the south uh, and is pointed towards the, the, the sea, and it will be a tower as opposed to the kind of flat uh, building from Herzog and the, and the Meron. <coughs> so it will potentially act as a kind of uh, compass on, a, on an urban uh, scale as the tower that maybe that kind of low building uh, uh, could do with, uh, and uh, also it provides for a, for a housing project uh, the, the, the advantage that all the units are looking towards the sea, which is a kind of uh, uh, advantage in terms of, of uh, uh, selling the, the units. Uh, so this is basically what we did. We also uh, uh, tried to make that triangle visible uh, from uh, the different areas of the city by chopping the, the top off so that you will see actually the, that arrow pointing towards the south. Uh, and, uh, and, and maybe the other thing that, that we were playing with was the, was the color, uh, which was gold. We, we thought that this 
had to be a golden building uh, to play with the with the uh, Yves Klein blue of uh, uh, Herzog at Demeron, almost like a, like a torero, like a bullfight uh, um, uh, suit. Uh, so the, the building is, is basically becomes this kind of uh, menhir uh, where there is uh, uh, 25 stories of, of uh, residential uh, units uh, 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 and uh, they are on top of, of some kind of common areas at the bottom and at the top of the of the tower, and then there are some kind of underground spaces. This is the the way this triangular tower, which is a, quite an infrequent uh, form for for residential, will take. It, it would, the most difficult thing about this project was actually to fit uh, uh, usable units uh, uh, around the, the, this uh, triangular. Uh, shape, but finally they uh, actually work uh, quite well. And th this is where, where we, we think that even if you start with an idea as, as silly as, in a way, as silly as this, uh, uh, you appropriate the prestige of the Herzog and the Meron building in order to win the competition and to, and to produce, then, then you can start discovering potentials of these ideas rather than, than abandoning them uh, I mean, maybe uh, uh, five years ago we would have started with the unit of the of the house and tried to construct something that is uh, interesting. And now we realize that you need to be able to enter into the, the discussion in a much more direct way if you want to uh, make simply make these projects possible, simply uh, have the, the possibilities of, of doing them, and that that doesn't exhaust the, 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 the potentials of the, of the project. The fact that you resort to these, uh, to these, uh, uh, these moves to, uh, to make the, the projects possible uh, doesn't mean that the project doesn't become interesting, that the project becomes incredibly interesting on many different ways. For example, it, when, once you start analyzing the, the structure of, of this, uh, this uh, triangle, you start finding uh, all sorts of uh, differences that you can uh, use. Once you start uh, looking at the cores of a tower like this, you see the, the wealth of forms that are uh, produced inside. Once you start thinking in how the, the, the surface of this <coughs> screen, golden screen, that uh, uh, will cover the building, uh, you start finding very interesting uh, materials and, and possibilities or the way the building touches the, the ground. So these are some of uh, some, <laughs> some uh, uh, images of, uh, of how the, the building will sit in the, in the site. We are now fighting with the, with the local authority to uh, let us uh, build something so high. Maybe it will not be as high as this finally, but Anyway, now this is a, um, <coughs> a kind of temporary building we are uh, we are on site with uh, now, and it will be completed uh, next March. It is um, a competition we won for the Spanish Pavilion uh, for the international exhibition to be held in Aichi in Japan uh, next next uh, next spring. Um, the, um, this is a kind of, uh, a kind of uh, circulation loop that limits all the pavilions. Uh, the infrastructure is given to you, meaning that there are a, a number of modules that are, uh, are built uh, and then are given to, different, to the different countries uh, and you have to occupy them and, if you like, uh, wrap them uh, to suit your purpose. We had five modules uh, here. Uh, to work with, uh, and uh, obviously, as it, it is to be a pavilion that uh, that needs to uh, represent um, Spain, uh, we started looking at um, mm. uh, the, the kind of Spanish history, uh, the, the history of Spain, and in particular, uh, that moment where um, Spain had a mix of uh, Christianity and and, uh, and the Islamic culture living side by side uh, quite happily. Uh, and, you know, as a kind of also, a, 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 if you like, a, a commentary to make uh, at this moment in time, uh, the fact that you, co you could have uh, interesting uh, um, uh, coexistence of, of uh, these religions and these cultures, and, you know, we uh, kind of also represent that. Um, 
but uh, obviously in Spain this uh, echoed uh, in, in its uh, architectural uh, also um, uh, history. Uh, for example, the fact that uh, there are the, the arches that come uh, from both of uh, both the, the kind of the churches and the mosques, uh, the lattices uh, that uh, they introduced uh, into, uh, into the architecture of Spain, uh, the colors uh, that to this day somehow represent uh, colors of Spain, and these become uh, the, the material for the project and, and, and we, we literally play with them. Um, the five modules make uh, this kind of uh, shape. Um, we have to obviously, uh, the content that goes into the pavilion has to do with a series of spaces that get occupied by uh, different, um, uh, let's say, representations of Spain from cooking to, to art, etc. That's not so interesting to discuss, but we uh, start arranging uh, a series of uh, chapels, if you like, chapels that chapel-like spaces that have uh, vaulted uh, ceilings uh, that um, uh, link to each other to produce uh, a, a series of uh, a kind of continuous exhibition-like uh, route um, that uh, reverberates uh, with, uh, with this uh, history that I mentioned. Uh, here you see that the chapels in section are also different heights, so it would be a kind of um, uh, varied experience as you move through the different chapel uh, spaces. And um, um, these are some images of, of the interiors. And of course then the, the external cladding, um, we uh, again look at uh, this, uh, this architectural uh, history of, of, uh, of, of, of Spain and, and look at um, the, the kind of um, uh, what am I looking for? The, the material? Ceramics. Ceramic. <laughs> um, the ceramics that uh, also are used and um, uh, start looking at uh, the possibilities of uh, cladding the building with ceramic, colored ceramic, um, do a kind of experiment of again tiling uh, of using six different shaped uh, tiles that produce a lattice-like, again remembering the lattices, a, a lattice-like uh, wrap uh, to, uh, to the pavilion and because of their, their differences of size and, and shape uh, produce a never repeating pattern that the pattern as they link it is, uh, it is uh, endlessly let's say differentiated. Um, they are uh, made from, from uh, the, the kind of the earth in Spain, they are made in Spain and shipped to Japan. This is another way of bringing the context uh, or transporting the context uh, and uh, basically these are some of the images. These are, uh, obviously, there is a, there is a space. This is, this is what we inherit, and this is what we cladded, and, and obviously we play with, with lighting day and night, uh, in and out, um, uh, and the kind of the patterns that it produces in this, uh, if you like, uncomfortable space. Um, and to you, Alejandro. <laughs> <laughs> last two, last two. Uh, we are uh, now part of the, of the uh, project that is preparing the bid of London 2012, the Olympic uh, Games. Uh, the bid is aimed not only at, uh, at producing the, the master plan of the, of the Olympic bid, but also master plan uh, the, this area of London, which is the Lower Lee uh, Valley, just uh, uh, north of uh, Canary Wharf on the east of London which is uh, uh, an area of London that has uh, this, uh, it looks like this now, it's an area that was, uh, basically has a very high uh, water table and uh, the Victorians simply ignored it when they were growing the city because it was too difficult to build on there. So it has, it became uh, by default uh, uh, the, the back of house of London. It became the, the area where the sewage was uh, located, where the dumps were located. Uh, it's, a, it's a topography that, that is made out of, out of uh, uh, almost I lines of infrastructure, train depots, industrial sheds, uh, and, and some, uh, one of the poorest uh, neighborhoods in, in, uh, in the UK, but also one of the most uh, multinationals. I think there are 103 languages spoken in this in this area of uh, London. And the first thing that we <coughs> started doing, because it was not only about uh, doing the master plan of the Olympics, but 
in, in a way, we, we won the, 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 the project, and this is not on, on only our project. We are, uh, as, uh, in a way, a small part in a very large organization that uh, includes also uh, EDAW, Allies and Morrison, uh, HOK Sports, uh, Bureau Happold. Uh, I mean, the team is really uh, gigantic, uh, and we are more. We 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 always say we are like the makeup artists in this uh, in this team. But uh, we are the makeup artists, and we can uh, we by by being the makeup artists, we have an enormous uh, power. We realize now. Uh, so the first thing that we, we uh, the, the way we we. Uh, um, uh, uh, won the, the, the project was by, by uh, saying that as opposed to the conventional um, Olympic village, Olympic park, this was not going to be a kind of flat land uh, with more or less sophisticated buildings uh, deployed onto it, but the, the whole image of the, <coughs> of, the, of the Olympics should be generated, should emerge out of uh, looking at the uh, at the site, at this uh, site in the in the Lee Valley, and uh, this almost like uh, Grange, uh, we we were uh, we call it uh, originally Grange Olympics, uh, a kind of Olympics that are not shiny and and white and uh, and uh, but they are uh, uh, tough and they come out of this uh, this uh, landscape. <coughs> First thing that we did was to analyze this stretch of seven and a half kilometers by one and a half kilometers and see how this can become, uh, so following this idea of growing from the, from the site rather than, than deploying the buildings onto a kind of flat landscape. We look at the neighboring communities that have grown there over time. <coughs> we tried uh, to extend them literally into the, into the site rather than uh, making some kind of precinct that will, uh, will be sold to uh, the, the, the future uh, kind of a precinct of uh, luxury uh, people uh, living close to the to the city. So, we, on the contrary, we we try to extend the neighboring communities to extend also the existing uh, Lee Valley Regional Park uh, uh, along the the, the <coughs> valley of the river uh, and along the the system of of canals. Uh, I forgot to mention that there is a lot of uh, canals that were part of the Victorian infrastructure that uh, uh, that are still uh, there and are part of a very important part of the landscape of the of the area <coughs> uh, and uh, we started by by looking also at the uh, at how the city uh, uh, relates to it you can see in this uh, diagram this this is the, the the traffic system around the Lee Valley and you see the amount of roads so these are all the roads that are touching the edge of the Lee Valley, and these are actually the ones that are crossing. So the first thing that we had to do was to connect them, uh, taking into account, obviously, <coughs> property, ownerships, and, and uh, infrastructure, and uh, uh, sites, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, uh, the, in a way, the, the, the proposal that we made <coughs> was this idea of the, uh, the, the thousand bridges. This will be the area of the thousand bridges because every one of these lines, you have several levels of, of, uh, of uh, topography in, on this side. You have the water table, you have uh, uh, the, the natural, or let's say there's nothing natural about this side because all the, the land is basically infill and, and, and uh, the earth that has been dumped uh, uh, in, the, in the area. Uh, then you have the, the roads, then you have the trains uh, on top and below. So it's basically a kind of infrastructural knot that you have to solve and you have to uh, try to stitch it by, by producing these uh, bridges, these points of, of crossing that will become uh, the, the main, uh, <coughs> the main uh, uh, object of this uh, master plan. Uh, uh, water table is uh, obviously a, a very interesting uh, problem in the in the site because there are uh, waters that are uh, controlled in the canals th where the, the water level is uh, is uh, artificially controlled, but there are areas where the river is still uh, uh, flooding uh, uh, and, uh, freely, uh <coughs> and that has to be. Uh, also uh, consider uh, one of the ideas in the master plan is to use the water as green 
so uh, because it's cheaper to maintain and, and it actually produces uh, increases the the value of the properties around these uh, water uh, bodies uh, more analysis that we did of uh, walking distances uh, in the uh, site uh, and basically out of this analysis we concluded that that area that is uh, red and orange are the best possible location for the future uh, uh, master plan because it's where we had uh, wider areas uh, available where we had a stronger connection to uh, Stratford which is here the future high-speed uh, train uh, uh, terminal of uh, Stratford uh, uh, and where we were uh, in a more barycentric position to all the uh, access points uh, of the underground and the train in the area. <coughs> uh, so, uh, I mean, these are uh, the, the, the reason why I'm showing you this, these analyses are analysis of density because obviously then we have to go into uh, the making of the fabric that will will cover the, the urban fabric that will cover the the, the valley. The, the the mayor wants to place between 35,000 and 50,000 housing units in this area. Uh, on top of the, the the Olympics, and one of the the, uh, the things that we were playing with was the the, the density of uh, construction around, no, not to uh, provide a kind of homogeneous density of construction, but on the contrary, to diversify it uh, uh, around the, the points, the major access points on into the site, <coughs> and uh, 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 in a way, all these comes to explain that the way we were generating the the project was not by deploying forms, but almost by growing structures uh, out of the site, very much in line with this idea that we explored uh, here in, in, uh, in, at the AA with, with uh, our unit, how these diagrams are somehow able to generate uh, form uh, uh, if, uh, if uh, they are conveniently uh, organized. Uh, <coughs> these are also uh, three stages that we have to consider. The, the Olympics may go on or may not go, and uh, there are basically three stages. The non-Olympic master plan, if the Olympics don't go, the area will look like uh, this. If the Olympics go or when the Olympics are going, it will look, look like this. You see the stadia. And then the legacy master plan. So it's almost like creating an organization that can uh, activate uh, different areas depending on on uh, on the conditions uh, uh, then we were given uh, requirements by the teams that specialize in in, uh, in uh, olympic facilities uh, this is basically the form that the the uh, olympic park will will take you see basically that that idea of relating to the topography oops to the topography of the um, of the river, uh, the canals, uh, is now forming the, the main uh, structure of, of the concourse, which is this bifurcated platform that is feeding into the different uh, venues. <coughs> uh, and, uh, and then after reaching this point, everybody, uh, and after trying to construct the project uh, from this bottom up system, everybody in the press started saying, okay, very good, but how does the stadium look like? Uh, and uh, suddenly, uh, we, I mean, this is also very, very uh, typical of that uh, problem of, of saying, okay, that we can generate new organizations from the bottom up, trying to generate consistency, et cetera, et cetera. But finally, those organizations need to be able to be communicated, need to be able to be broadcast, need to be able to be explained to, uh, to the public, and so on and so forth. Then we started thinking, so how are we going to deal with that? Because we don't have the commission to do these buildings. But we have to, in a way, give the idea of how this, this uh, thing will look like. So we started thinking in this kind of uh, uh, forms that uh, uh, for are part of the, of the meanders of the, of the canals or the rivers, which, which are the forms of the, of the muscles, no? this kind of shape. And then we started thinking that maybe one way of, of addressing the, the buildings uh, and, and thematizing them uh, in respect to that organization that had gr grown out of the, uh, the site was perhaps to relate to the, to the human body as 
as some, some sort of analog and make this Olympic Park uh, almost uh, uh, topography that is like a, like a body made out of muscles and, and, and uh, veins and, and nerves and where the, the skin, the topography of the park uh, uh, become almost like, uh, like uh, the surface of a, of a body uh, uh, under stress. Uh, so this is the kind of porn version of uh, of uh, of uh, the uh, and and then basically with this idea of the of the human body of the muscle we started addressing the technology of building the the stadia. There are different types of venues. Some of them covered, some of them open, some of them temporary, some of them permanent. There are in this kind of matrix. And so how this this muscle becomes a, becomes maybe an arch becomes a geometry that first we found in the in the water uh, structure in the side, but now we turn it around and, and it becomes uh, part of the, of the building uh, structure of the site and what kind of technologies can uh, be used to produce these, uh, these roofs uh, and how the, the stadia uh, are <coughs> then related to this, this kind of bifurcating, this striated uh, 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 concourse that is providing access on, on different levels and fixing, so the, the, the stadia are no longer uh, 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 objects landing on a field, but they are very much part of the structure of the paths uh, that, uh, that move along the, the, the rivers and the canals moving uh, north, south uh, in, the, in, the, in the river. So these are some images of, uh, of this. I mean, th this is all tentative, obviously. There is nothing fixed about this. These are simply ideas that will be given to the people to do the, the different uh, object uh, competitions. Uh, you can see uh, how this, this idea of the, of the muscle or, or the skin becomes mar more directly uh, communicated in the, in the, in the buildings. Uh, so this is, uh, we think, a, a very interesting example of, of, uh, of uh, that dichotomy always between the internal consistency, the kind of disciplinar uh, content of the, of the project and how it is communicated. And uh, we, f we are finding that increasingly a very interesting field of, of research in the, in the office. I get a bit worried sometimes when Alejandro brings uh, this uh, argument and the way he puts it forward. So I want to kind of uh, mellow it down a bit. Uh, I, I, the, the issue is not how to sell the project, but knowing <laughs> that, uh, you know, it, it, it's, uh, he says it, I think, a little bit too strongly. It's no, you know, we, we, the, when we won the Yokohama project, uh, we went to a press conference and everybody asked us, so what was your idea? And uh, so we started saying, well, we took the circulation system and then we thought how do you turn it three-dimensional and then we thought how you, and everybody was totally bored and they thought I mean what is this what was your idea and uh, what they wanted to hear was that it looked like a like a whale or it looked like a flying carpet or it looked like a uh, you know so this is what they wanted to hear uh, the fact and we realized uh, we realized that in some ways uh, uh, the power of, uh, of uh, Yokohama is the, is the fact that it resonates, uh, it, it is a kind of ambiguous form, and it re resonates uh, with a lot of different, um, let's say, sources outside, outside of itself. We built it in the way we did. Uh, we set up a machine, if, if you like, or an engine to, d to, d to, d to, d to d drive the generation of the project. But finally, the fact that maybe di many different kinds of people like it, uh, it's not just the people who like necessarily curves or people, it, it seems, to, uh, and, and maybe it, it is because it resonates with many different things. Now, the projects that we are showing tonight, maybe some of them are more or successful because maybe they have, they, they, they resonate with less or more systems of resonance outside <coughs> of themselves. And, and uh, we think that the more, obviously, you can play with, the more ambiguous becomes this, this uh, digestion of these external forces, and it becomes something of its own. Now, uh, maybe the directness now with, uh, with the kind of Olympic project 
is a success, but maybe the fact that we haven't actually got the commission, we haven't actually worked uh, through it, we haven't digested more information, it also lacks that ambiguity, I would, I would kind of say. It, it is powerful in some ways, but it also has, has its kind of directness that needs to be toned down. Now, um, so there is the, the, the kind of uh, the idea that we are putting forward is not to learn how to sell the project, but knowing that the building doesn't exist in a vacuum, knowing that the building sits in a kind of cultural context, how can you anticipate that and how can you actually play with those, bring them into the exercise and, and add them to, to the ingredients that you work with? So just to kind of tone down a little bit of that selling exercise. Um, <coughs> the last project, is this the last project? Yes. What we are going to show you is a competition uh, we won a year ago for a music center uh, for the BBC in London. Um, the project uh, hasn't been fully uh, kind of uh, really uh, taken off yet, hopefully in the new year. Uh, but this is a, a very interesting um, uh, uh, project to show because it is the opposite of the exercise we followed with the police station. Whereas in the police station, we tried to disappear uh, and, and we therefore embarked on this exercise of how can we make the building uh, blend with its context. Here the commission was how can you make an iconic building? Uh, so you can either tell the client, oh, I am not interested in the iconic, or you can try to kind of uh, turn that into an, a, a kind of uh, a, a, an exercise in itself and say, well, how can I make this building emerge and how do I produce the identity for this emergence uh, that is not, um, if you like, superficial, that somehow it starts tapping into the nature of uh, what the project wants to be. Uh, the site is uh, this uh, triangular shaped site on the White City uh, uh, campus of uh, the BBC. Um, it, uh, originally we had to place an office building and a music center, so part of the exercise was how do you, do you link them, do you do two buildings, do you do one. Um, perhaps uh, what is more interesting to discuss tonight is the music center. We start uh, looking for um, uh, this identity, uh, look at uh, music as the building uh, content. Uh, the building was to house studios uh, for musicians to rehearse mainly, but, but sometimes to have uh, through invitation public to also listen to them. Uh, music is obviously a linear sequence of events in time, so it takes a, a kind of, lin it's a linear organization. When it gets recorded, it uh, takes this uh, band-like or tape-like uh, form, uh, also moving images that are also part of the BBC, BBC activities, again get um, recorded in this uh, band-like uh, organization. So we start playing literally with uh, a band of material that wraps and uh, links and divides the various spaces that the building needs to contain. Now, this produces two uh, faces, uh, a kind of um, an open end and, and a closed end that we uh, recognize as, as uh, instruments that we can use to uh, communicate uh, the two different ways that the BBC engages with the public. Uh, one through a kind of direct uh, engagement, obviously, uh, these studios being open through invitation to the public, uh, but we extend that through saying that perhaps here one can literally expose the, the studios to the street and let people see uh, into the studios as if you're invited to a backstage, as if uh, you, you're given the privilege of seeing something that you cannot see always. And the closed side becomes this uh, screen, uh, the possibility to be a screen that you could broadcast music. You can. Uh, for example, um, connect uh, this envelope to, to, um, um, uh, to computers that visualize music to turn them into, into uh, visual information. Um, now, knowing that uh, it is uh, close to the West Way uh, and that we were trying to make this building that appears, uh, that has presence on site, and yet it, the square meters of the building was very small, uh, and that was a problem because we were supposed to appear, be iconic, and yet uh, compared to uh, the, the buildings that were around, the building was, uh, the square meters was, was small. So we thought that if we would uh, work with a compact plan and make the building as vertical as possible, 
uh, we would have more chance to, to, to kind of make this uh, appearance. Uh, for example, uh, the approach from Wood Lane uh, tube station. Um, oh, what's the next one? And, and through uh, being a compact, not actually using all the ground that we were given, we would surround the building uh, constantly with, uh, with open spaces that would allow us to maximize the exposure and the engagement between the building and the public. Um, now, this um, um, uh, then banded uh, uh, kind of box-like uh, uh, building or form uh, gets occupied with very simply with a very simple functional diagram. Uh, two studios uh, that were required placed in parallel uh, divided by an acoustic uh, space, acoustic buffer uh, that is necessary and, and then occupied by control rooms that are placed uh, in a kind of optimal position so that you can look into each studio and rearrange the musicians uh, in, in a number of ways. And public uh, get access from one side, uh, which is this kind of open window side, and uh, storage and musicians access, etc., happens from the other. A very simple arrangement. Um, I already mentioned the, the relative position of control rooms to the studios. And we play uh, with with the context, uh, with the ground, with the differences of levels between uh, the approach level and the, the rest of the BBC site as a way of uh, contextualizing this uh, basic uh, envelope and uh, building a foyer as a, as a kind of uh, undercraft uh, or a belly uh, just under the studios and having the studios at a, at a kind of optimal height so that the public on approach could actually see into the studios without uh, disturbing uh, the musicians. And um, this then uh, obviously evolves onto on us uh, facing, um, th this, these are the different sides of the building, the, the, the approach side seeing directly into the studios. The other side, uh, maybe I should have mentioned that this gray zone are all the other support facilities to the studios. Uh, there are production suites, uh, offices, uh, library, etc., that produce this other uh, face of the building. Again, the, all the functions of the building uh, exposed as a way of um, giving intricacy to 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 the to the different sides. Um, the lobby that I mentioned that then introduces uh, uh, this uh, stair as a way to bring the public up to the studio through invitation. Um, at just above the control rooms, because the, obviously the studios are much higher than the control rooms, we place uh, the collective spaces, the relaxation spaces to the musicians that, um, again, has views onto the studios, but also to the outside. It was always having visited the venue uh, that they are currently using in Maida Vale, uh, it is uh, a, a black box. The musicians never see outside, never see daylight. So uh, one of the uh, maybe more pragmatic con considerations here, thinking of them, was how can you maximize their exposure to the outside, to, 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 to the public, but also to literally daylight. So the studios look uh, out, obviously, here, but have the possibility to uh, blank themselves off, whereas this musician's gallery here looks out onto uh, wood Lane and uh, also to, to the sky, into the studios, etc. This is a view of that space looking the other way onto Wood Lane. And a basic section of the building showing that this may be more simplistic uh, idea of uh, a band that wraps and produces this uh, kind of identity to the building uh, then becomes an actually a kind of technical engine for the building. It uh, has a, a kind of varied uh, thickness. Um, we will need a, a, a kind of a particular type of construction called box-in-box -box construction where you have a structure inside that is isolated from the structure outside for acoustic reasons. This produces one of the, um, uh, let's say, determinants of the thickness of this uh, band, but also there are services inside there that uh, go in and then on the interior. Again, there is another uh, intricacy that, that is um, introduced uh, to the band on the inner face uh, that is uh, again for acoustic reasons, etc. Um, now, having uh, decided uh, that we have this window side, uh, it 
uh, obviously has to be solved technically because m m music studios want to be generally uh, a closed box. Um, so we, and, and glass also, uh, we all know that it's not necessarily just uh, transparent, that the reflection of uh, skies of things outside on it make it imp incredibly opaque. So we start looking at the technical resolution of, of what we proposed and this uh, starts uh, evolving the project and adding more, if you like, character to the different uh, faces of, of this uh, form. Uh, we, for example, study the angle of this glass and realize that if we tilt it by six degrees, it uh, produces, uh, uh, first of all, a kind of acoustic magic to the, to the square box. Um, and also, maybe it will come later, uh, what it also does is uh, that it minimizes uh, the reflection of the sky on the lower part of the glass so that uh, the public on the outside actually will be able to look into the studios. We start introducing this uh, glass skin, it's actually three layers of glass, um, uh, and we introduce uh, two layers of blinds that are um, for uh, blackening and, and also for a shading device that can be used in a number of ways to, I don't know why it's got stuck there, um, to obviously moderate or, or uh, give flexibility to how the space is used and its level of uh, uh, interface with the outside. This is what I mentioned earlier, that this tilt um, makes sure that throughout this cone uh, you get uh, actually visibility into the, into the interior this section that I mentioned with the three layers of glass. Um, and, and obviously, the, the, the problematic of having to have three layers of glass with a certain depth or, or a distance between them is also then uh, used uh, uh, to the kind of environmental advantage of the building. It acts as a kind of trombe wall and uses the energy efficiently, efficiently throughout the seasons. But more importantly, um, it starts uh, obviously uh, echoing on how the building will appear on the outside. Uh, you would sometimes see these uh, blinds closed, sometimes open, and it really becomes uh, like a kind of theater, a, a much more dynamic building. We always uh, talked about uh, the building not being frozen. It's a building that is where production, music is produced, and we thought that it would be uh, interesting if uh, this um, aspect of the building, this character of the building was also part of uh, its, uh, the, the nature of the building, that it would also change uh, with, with uh, the changes inside. Uh, the structure I mentioned already, maybe we don't need to get into here. And then the screen side, um, we, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we, we thought that it would be good to use this, its broadcasting possibility. We um, have uh, proposed that it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a stainless steel um, uh, cladding that on top of which we uh, place a, a dichromatic uh, film that uh, changes color as you move around the building. Um, so color, again, being associated with the BBC uh, uh, is, is brought in as another external uh, factor onto the, the kind of the, 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 the project car or the building character. And we also researched into the possibility of embedding into this uh, cladding uh, LED lights at um, quite close intervals so that you would be able to um, connect that to, to, to the music inside and visualize music, but also visualize other kinds of information. This is the kind of pixelation that one could have with uh, the budget that we had to produce this kind of graphic quality images. Maybe there are too many of them. And, and, and uh, obviously, these are, uh, again, this is again a project that hasn't gone through its uh, kind of um, process of uh, uh, further development. What do I do with this? Um, and, and therefore, it lacks uh, another scale of material that would further uh, uh, evolve and uh, and change, uh, but but also evolve uh, the 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 building uh, uh, character maybe in a more at a different scale. This is what I mentioned about uh, the fact that the building 
could change color constantly as you change your uh, orientation in respect to the building. Oh, did I hate this music. Music is part of the selling strategy. No, no, come on, Alejandro. <laughs> <laughs> How do you say to go on <laughs> <laughs> Don't you have something to switch off the music? Explain a little bit, no? Um, yes, <laughs> because I'm so obsessed with switching this music up. Um, well, the lobby, and obviously it's, continu it's kind of continuity with, uh, with the approach uh, levels. This is uh, this stair that would be accessible through invitation to the public. Uh, we go now into the studios that is um, basically this, uh, at the moment, this wooden shelf where the different faces are either smooth or, or articulated because of uh, questions of acoustics. Um, you turn, and this is obviously the glass end. Um, these are seatings for the public that are obviously retractable. I think we go back to mm -hmm. Okay, I think we, 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 we stop here uh, and we take questions from you. Thank you. Okay, um, we have a bit of time. I feel I ought to ask you first, like, if you have any questions or criticisms you'd like to make of each other. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, do we have some questions from the audience? <coughs> Maybe while people are thinking, I mean, th there's a, a sort of topic which you seem to me to have kind of touched on, uh, but not exactly broached, which is this. You, you've talked about a certain kind of transformation kind of in, in the practice which you variously described. I mean, at one level, it was like how you maintain a certain internal consistency, but as it were, engage kind of with more external forces. And, and that, at some level, mm. was kind of linked to uh, the way in which you make public kind of analyses or kind of descriptions of the project. But I suppose it's worth really kind of pushing the question a bit further. I mean, to what extent has an engagement with those external forces actually fed back, in some sense, mm. to formally transform the design process? Mm. Do you know, I mean, it, it seemed to me that was sort of opened up by what you said, but in a way perhaps not kind of fully mm. addressed. Mm. Well, yeah. I, I, I think probably we... Does this work? Yes. Uh, Probably we, we didn't uh, broach it because we, we are actually in the middle of it. We don't know uh, what is going to be the final effect on the, on the, <coughs> on the practice of being engaged with all these different uh, uh, external forces rather than trying to uh, develop a more consistent uh, internal uh, uh, process. But I think that, that uh, simply looking at the projects that we show today, you can see that there are, there are uh, triangles, there are uh, cubes, there are, there are not all, always uh, surfaces. There is a variety of uh, formal structures that we, we are being <coughs> getting engaged with that, that are probably very different from what everybody knows the, the practice or the, or the forms that uh, that we that we explored uh, perhaps in, in the earlier part of the of the of the practice whether <coughs> this eventually leads into another level of consistency I actually don't know at this point maybe I would like to add something to that I um, 
that uh, I, I think what what it ha I mean in in the in a more bottom up uh, or the top down whichever you choose way of generating the project uh, more internal um, we seem to always work in a very linear uh, way and also with more or less one scale at the time either you know going from top down or going going with, with the large scale or or the small scale and and I think that um, having to uh, always respond to all these different external uh, factors that now we accept as being allowed into the project to be generative for the project and uh, make us work in a kind of trans scalar way at any one time uh, you know we don't go from from the big to the small or from the small to the big in a linear way but work at all these scales at the same time and, and I think that it makes it more difficult uh, if your ultimate goal is to uh, construct consistency it's more difficult but it's also more interesting maybe and more fun Um, I mean, after Yokohama, I mean, to hear you, I mean, speak about uh, types and analogues and conventions in a way is very provocative. And it's like a bombshell. And I, I think it's, it, it's raised a whole range of questions. And perhaps just to take one, I mean, um, one which came to mind, and perhaps also with the example of the project in New York for Ground Zero in mind, is how you imagine the relationship on the one hand between systems, which I guess is a way I would be inclined to understand a project like Yokohama, and on the other, types and conventions, be it you know, for office space or for concert hall, on the other, I mean, do you find that there is um, a conflict there which is to be resolved over a, a period of time that you are back in the laboratory in some way? So uh, how do you feel about it? I, I, it's totally intentional. I mean, I, I, I think that the case of Yokohama was a particular <coughs> situation we were accidentally put in, meaning we did a competition. It was for a strange kind of building that, you know, it wasn't a kind of a, a standard functional type that we we could work with because it was a ferry terminal mixed with all kinds of other things, and therefore it produced a certain kind of experiment and a certain kind of result. Uh, I think it would be wrong to say that we have to turn that into an ideological position just because the first project that we did presented us with uh, with with a project that we. We couldn't really refer to history, to typology, etc. Um, you know, since uh, then, in fact, we've turned typology into a research. You know, looking at typology and and but not about repeating typology, replicating typology, but just using it as raw material in the same way that you can look at densities and you can look at uh, um, construction systems, etc., and turn them into a kind of uh, raw material that you can evolve and you can work with. Um, I, I, nobody knows how long it will go on for, um, but I, I would say that we are conscious of, of, um, of using these uh, sources and that we don't, we don't think that they are taboo. That I basically the, the, mm. that the discipline produces knowledge and that it would be foolish if you have to design an office building that you don't go back and, and look at office buildings. But obviously, if you're committed to experimentation, in practice, you try to evolve it and to, to, to uh, connect it with what that organization needs contemporarily and not what office building needed uh, when the Neufort was put together. I, I, I um, think that you, you were a kind of frequent criti critic uh, of Deep Five when we were uh, teaching here. <coughs> and you uh, probably, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, uh, I think, We've been always uh, secretly interested in typology. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, we, when we were doing all these analyses and all these uh, uh, experiments, with, we were always looking at typology. But, but I think there are different ways of looking at typology. 
typology as something that you replicate, as a system of replication of something that has been verified, or as uh, some material that you can abstract, and that was very much things that we were developing here in the, in the unit, you abstract <coughs> typological material and you reconfigure it so that potentially it generates something, something new. And, and <coughs> it has been simply a kind of realization that uh, all our kind of uh, critique to typology, et cetera, et cetera, was not really a critique to typology because finally we were constantly resorting to typology. It was a critique to a certain use of, uh, of this, uh, let's say, disciplinary knowledge in a, in a non-critical and repetitive manner rather than in a, in a kind of generative manner. I think that the case of, of the World Trade Center is a, is a clear uh, example. That's why we, we like it of how to relate to history, to relate to the <coughs> discipline in a generative manner rather than in a, in a kind of rep uh, repetitive manner. Sure. Um, well, thank you. It was a really fascinating talk, I think, for everyone in school. I mean, I can remember a time, five years plus, when uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a very quick question about lexicon and, and, and language. Um, when words like ornament, metaphor, analogy would probably have been banned, you know, from, from your lectures. There would have been a bouncer, a metaphorical bouncer at the front door who wouldn't have allowed these words into the lecture hall or into your, your thing. So I'm kind of interested in how your lexicon has, um, has developed, how it's enlarged, and, and whether you woke up one day and realized, because you do need to speak to journalists at some point, and you do need to speak to your uh, clients and the public, that, oh my god, you know, I need to read page 692 and page 1024 of the dictionary, or, um, or, or is this, does this sort of also develop quite morphologically with the work. I'm, I'm sort of interested because, simply because for me, the last time I think I saw you lecture was a number of years ago, and actually I think it was Fashid mm. was during construction of, of mm. Yokohama. And that was also interesting because I think you're already moving mm. away and on, onto another trajectory, but even today it's even more dramatic mm. somehow, yeah. how you're talking about the work. So could you say something about uh, the, the language that you're, you're using uh, now? Yeah, um, I, I think it's, uh, it's not just language. Uh, and it's probably not so clear what initiates it. I think probably it initiates being in practice and at some point having to communicate, um, whether you call it about, uh, if it's a pure language or, or li more than that, of how to, um, how to build into the project an element that communicates. Um, it probably initiated, and, and then maybe we thought that it, it, it was successful in one of the, I cannot remember in which one, maybe we, we, we realized that actually it can be turned for a kind of engine for the project and, and that it, it, it need not be you know, purely a selling exercise. And, and, and uh, I, I do say again, uh, we, you know, for example, I've been teaching for the last uh, three, day, uh, three years typology and ornamentation. And the, the, none of them look like, you know, Venturi and Scott Brown, and uh, none of them, and they are, they are as experimental as the unit was at the AA. Uh, they deal with different scales, and they play with different kinds of material. So it is conscious, and, and probably in it, it initiated out of communication, but I don't think that now it is, uh, we are, you know, in practice, and we are being driven by clients, and, uh, you know, there is al you always have to have a double agenda. Mm. Uh, you have your agenda and you have the agenda outside and, and uh, if you are committed to experimentation you're never going to let uh, the kind of the outside uh, agenda rule you. You, you you use it to your advantage and the advantage here is to experiment and produce architecture good architecture hopefully <laughs> <laughs> no. are there any more questions well let me put it <coughs> It's like a last stab at the same sort of question. Um, I mean, especially this term when we're having a large symposium on kind of architectural education, I suppose another way of asking this question, I mean, because there obviously can be some students in the room thinking, after all those years, now you tell us. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are also learning. <laughs> um, when you look kind of back on it, do you think, to some extent, the, the change from, as it were, an account of your practice 
which was once so, I mean, more governed by what you might call internal consistency and the research and theoretical development of that, and less concerned with what you're now representing as kind of like the external forces. Um, and there still seems to be a certain division of labor between you, um, sort of, Fashid seems to be doing the internal consistency <laughs> and you're going for the kind of external forces. Um, but to what extent would you, in, ret in, in retrospect, kind of relate that actually to the difference between the practice of teaching? Mm. I mean, I know you've got the Yokohama kind of project mm. then, but to what extent do you think, as it were, there is a kind of institutional pressure to make the practice sound more internally consistent when you're teaching and more this way, as it were, when it's an effect of being in practice? Because I think in a, the answer to that question is itself important for architectural education. Mm. Yeah, I, I think that, that this, was, uh, this was something that, that it was always present in the in, I, I don't know if you remember when we were teaching here and, and when we've been teaching in other uh, institutions, we have always used real projects. From the, from the very beginning, we started teaching at the AA, we always looked out for opportunities for people who were uh, interested in, in doing uh, uh, projects outside. We, we, we would then uh, sit down uh, in the office and think, Okay, this year at the AA, what will be cool would be to to research uh, this or that, and we are gonna do uh, an atelier for an artist in order to research this. We f we have always needed that external uh, pressure in order to develop the, the the research, and the research developed in in uh, <coughs> out of this uh, contact with uh, with forces. <coughs> out of, for example, I think that one of the things that that uh, was more typical of the the work we were doing here in the five was this this need of almost accountability. The students were constantly accountable to a number of different forces. Couldn't go on and say, "Oh, I think that it should be like that," or "I have this uh, this vision." So, if if the question is how do you turn this into a didactic, uh, I would say that uh, in a way we are not so interested in, in, in we've never been interested in uh, education as, an, as, a, as a kind of communication of a series of ideologies or recipes or, but education as something that is intrinsically linked to research. And in the moment in which you link education and research, in the moment in which you say here we are simply seeing what are the, the current developments and we are trying to address them in a, in a different way and we don't know, we don't really know, we don't have a, a body of knowledge that we can uh, uh, put together, is where, where we think that, that actually the most interesting uh, forms of education uh, occur. Not, not as, a, as a kind of uh, framing of some sort of ideological, in, in a way we don't see practice and theory as two different entities. We don't see education and research as two different entities, but as, as, as one single uh, uh, process. And therefore, is, I, I think it's now as difficult as it was before in the, let's say, more, more experimental or, or more wilderness uh, age of the, of the uh, practice uh, to, 